What's up guys, Leon here, welcome back to Tesla on the Mirror. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by electrostatic machines. When I was 13, I built my first Van de Graaff generator using a rubber band and a coke can. Van de Graaff generators are pretty simple in terms of construction, but Wimsurf's machines, however, are oh, f <laughs> a bit more complex. And I have to admit, they just look awesome. Like a futuristic machine, but from a bygone era. A few years ago, I built this whim search with the help of my 3D printer. Successfully. But two months ago, I came across a model from the past. Its condition? Very bad. I made it to my mission to restore it and tease its original sparkling bag out of it. It was a lot of work, but it was really worth it. Take a look at this beautiful article pattern from the early 1920s. The discharges are really impressive. We're talking about 100,000 volts here, guys. So about 11 centimeters. Then I came across an old newspaper article. Normally I don't read newspaper, but this article is from 1901. Generating X-rays with a Bonetti machine. A Bonetti machine, in principle, is a Wimshurst machine, but without metal sectors. How cool would that be to have the same setup as in the pictures? But with a small machine, no chance. We need more power. And then, guys, I got really lucky. I found this Bonetti machine on the internet. I didn't have to think twice, drove to Berlin and pick it up straight away. The story behind this machine is at least as exciting as the machine itself. Back in the day, the grandfather of the charming old lady who sold me the machine bought it directly from Alfred Versen. But who was Alfred Versen? He was an instrument maker based in Berlin and held several patents related to the development of the Wimsurst machine. In one of his patents, he describes discs for Wimsurst machines where the metal sectors are embedded in the insulating material and shaped with serrated or wavy edges to increase the surface area and reduce corona losses. He built his optimized machines and sold them for medical as well as educational purposes in his shop in Berlin. From the official telephone directory for the district of the Reichspostdirektion Berlin from 1938, I was able to gather that Alfred Versen was the mind behind the well-known Voltana machines. I'd love to show you a photo of him, but after 1938, the information about the family, his son Heinz and his wife Margarete, basically disappears. But one thing is certain, he was an OG. I even called all the Verens families in Germany and asked if their great-grandfather happened to be called Heinz or Alfred. <laughs> but no luck. I even visited the former production site. <sighs> I wish I had a time machine. And take a look at this machine. It's huge. I dated between 1905 and 1910. So it's at least 115 years old. At that time, there were no plastics yet. This is all ebonite, a hard rubber made from sulfur and natural rubber. Normally, ebonite is black. The brown color comes from the aging and oxidation of the rubber and the sulfur compounds. And as you can see, the ebonite discs are wrapped as well. I've already had a lot of fun with the ebonite of the smaller Wimsurst machine. One of the glass cylinders of the Leyden jar is unfortunately broken. We don't have the charge either. The rest of the machine looks good. We just have to clean and preserve it well. So guys, now we have to straighten the disc and sand and polish the ebonite. Then it will shine black again. On top of that, the oxidation layer is anything but insulating and prevents the machine from working. And as I told you a few moments ago, we have to replace both Leyden jars and clean and preserve the rest. And that's going to be a lot of work. Now we move on to dismantling the machine. In fact, it's quite more work than you think. For me, it was sometimes even quite stressful. Screw and plug connections that have been a single unit for 115 years are very reluctant to come apart. Man, there are quite a lot of parts. Getting all this clean up and restored is a lot of work. Oh. 
Hope that it will take us not decades. First we're going to replace the light in jars. Well, of course, keep the old ones, you never know. It's actually not easy to replace light in jars, because over the 25 cm length they taper slightly. So a simple glass tube is out of the question. We need a real glass blower. And for that, Ralf Müller is just the right guy. I sent him my measurements and he reproduced the conical glass cylinders one to one. That's really craftsmanship. I've linked his website down below. Inside the Leiden jars are corks. We renew those as well. For that I bought these large corks on Amazon. Clamped in the drill, we'll turn them down to the right size. We'll simply make the inner electrode of the Leiden jars out of aluminum foil. On the outside we'll glue a tin sheet. That's true to the original. Back then there was no aluminum tab yet. We now clean the wood with a mild water and dish soap solution. It's important to wipe the wet surface immediately afterwards with a dry cloth so that the wood doesn't swell. Some people would now say you just could repaint the wood, but in my opinion the machine would really lose its authenticity that way. The more original patina you keep, the better. We'll preserve the wood with renaissance wax. We apply it, let it soak and then polish it at the end with a cloth. That gives us a nice authentic shine. I'll stick felt pads on the bottom though, otherwise you could potentially scratch up your table. So guys, now we come to the part that is the most important, but the least fun, definitely. Restoring the Ebonite discs. First we roughly clean the discs. Stop! Never use water. Never! It starts to stink like crazy. That's because the sulfur compounds react with the water. But we can use isopropanol alcohol. As you can clearly see, the ebonite disc have wrapped a lot over the decades. The good thing is, from around 60 degrees Celsius, ebonite slowly becomes softer and can be reshaped. I cut two plates to the size of the discs. One disc is placed between the two plates and then it goes into the oven at about 60 degrees for roughly 30 minutes. After that everything is flat again. To restore the insulating ability I'll now sand down the surfaces first with 100 and then with 600 grit sandpaper. It's hellish work. Afterwards we can polish the plates with a car polish. Looks good, doesn't it? The disc now shine with the same gloss they had 115 years ago. We now repeat the same procedure with all the other Ebonite components. We polish the metal rods and the spheres with the baking soda paste. That's gentle and doesn't scratch the material. In principle everything is finished and just need to be assembled. But one thing is still missing. The drive belt. Nowadays the belt would probably be made out of polyurethane. But back then that didn't exist. And what did they use? Leather. I got this 5mm leather belt which is normally intended for antihic sewing machines. So why not also for Wimshurst machines? Ah, Take a look at her guys. I wonder what the old lady's grandfather would think if he know that his Bonetti machine is getting a second life. That's a beautiful thought. Anyway, I don't want to keep you in suspense for too long now. Since the Bonetti machine is externally excited, we now have to apply a charge to one side of the disc. It's important that the humidity is as low as possible. Ideally below 50%. Even better if you blow the machine dry with a hairdryer before operation. At the beginning of the 20th century this machine was high tech for most of the people. Generating lightning using mother power blurred the line between physics and magic. 
Nowadays, it's more like a lost technology. Even more than 115 years later, the machine still captivates its viewer with its snapping, hand-generated sparks. The life of this machine is far from over and the thought that my future grandchildren will look at this with the same fascination as I did fills me with warmth. So guys, in my opinion, that was an awesome project. I really love Wimser's machines. Now I just have to find an old X-ray tube that doesn't ruin me immediately financially. And then we will be able to recreate the old newspaper article. With that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave me a comment down below. And then guys, we'll see us in the next video.